In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed the fruit of thy Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sins. Now be our our death. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created. Let us pray. O oh God, it instruct the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit. Grant us by the same Spirit may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lady Fatima. Pray for us. Saint Joseph. Pray for us. Saint Ignatius. Pray for us. Brun Land Terry. Pray for us. O God, his angels and saints. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. So the brief prayer catechesis I like to um, base on a short biblical passage and a book that was written by a very humble lay brother. St. Paul when he was preaching in the Areopagite, which would be when he's pre preaching to the Greeks, uh, he said to them, I proclaim to you, as I was looking through your, your different gods there, the unknown, the unknown God. Then he preaches our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But uh, St. Paul, knowing the culture of the Greeks, he, he would quote their poetry. And this is one of, my, one of fa my favorite poetic expressions of the New Testament. Now St. Paul says, as one of your poets say, but he doesn't mention the poet. And he says, in him we live and move and have our being. I love that phrase. In him we live and move and have our being. In him we live and move and have our being. Okay, I'd like to make a connection to that by a humble lay brother whose name was Brother Lawrence. Have any of you heard of Brother Lawrence? And the essence of his spirituality, and you can get the little book that he wrote, is holiness depends on one thing, is being aware of the presence of God. Being aware of the presence of God and maintaining contact with God. Most Catholics live what is called a compartmentalized life. You know what that means? Compartmentalized life means, okay, I'm, I'm a Catholic Sunday from 9 to 10, and uh, okay, then I take off my Catholic arm and I go back by living a life of a pagan. A lot of Catholics live that way. Whereas we're Catholics, 25 hours a day, okay, eight days a week, like the Beatles used to say, eight days for loving a week, okay, and 366 days a year. There's no vacation from being a Catholic. We're Catholics always. So we want to dismiss and expel that idea that we're Catholics, we're Catholics sometime. Rather, we're Catholics always. Okay, I'm saying that because, because during this retreat, 
you probably had the prefabricated idea when you came in, okay, God's going to speak to me, God's going to speak to me when I do my four hours of meditation and during the Mass and maybe when, you know, Brother J.R., Father Victor, Father Rome, they're giving their, their little spiel. Okay, that's when God's going to, he's going to speak. Uh, but what about those other, those other 18 hours during the day? Is God only present during some moments? No, in Him we live and move and have our being. So in kind of a roundabout way, what I'm saying is this, is um, try to be aware of the other moments of the day in which God can, God can, can be speaking to you. So God exists 24 seven. So it's a, good, it's a good idea, the rest of the retreat, to be aware of other moments, times, circumstances that God is going to be knocking at, your, at the door of your heart. Now I would even say when you're writing down in your, your notebook, be aware of those other, those other moments. Because God always exists. We forget the presence of God, but God never forgets us. Do you remember that biblical phrase of Paul quoting this anonymous poet? In him, we live and move and have our being. St. Anthony Mary Claret said he was most aware of God when he was working apostolically. Interesting. I pray for that grace too. Most aware of God when he was you know, preaching and teaching and confessing. You would probably think it's the other way around, but God was enlightening him in a very special way when he was carrying out his apostolic works. Why not? Okay, so that's my, um, my brief catechetical comment on prayer. Okay, today we're going to focus on what we started last night. We're going to be focusing on God's infinite mercy. God's infinite mercy. Even in the midst of the meditation on the somewhat demanding topic of sin, which is, is demanding, we should never separate sin from God's mercy. Romans chapter 5 where sin abounds can you finish it? Okay, where sin abounds God's grace and mercy abounds all the more. And God allows evil, God allows evil to bring greater good out of evil. So you might even do this sometime today in your meditation. Rewind the film of your life and see your moral failures. what seem to be maybe moral disasters in your life and see how God allowed that to bring greater good out of it. You 
you hear me? Yes. Very important. God, God allowed something. God allowed us to do something that was wrong, but he intervened and he actually brought greater good out of that. It's incredibly how intelligent God is. Wow. Uh, I'm blown away at times how, how kind, loving, patient, merciful, how intelligent God is. We can make a huge flop or blunder and God turns that into a major victory. So the, the worst disaster in your life could end up by being the greatest victory. I'll give you the, the best example, the best, best theological example in the world. I don't think it can go beyond this. As a result of the sin of Adam and Eve, that was a, a moral tsunami that has repercussions until the end of the world. What happened as a result of that? The incarnation and the redemption. So the sin of Adam and Eve, one of my brothers talked about that, is not a joke. It's not a joke. But God right away intervenes in the Proto-Evangelium, right? Genesis 3.15. I put enmity between you and the woman, her offspring and yours, and she will crush your head. That's called the Proto-Evangelium, the first, the first good news. This is a, right after the, the sin of Adam and Eve. So you might spend some, some time in gratitude and thankfulness for God intervening in your life and bringing good out of evil. I love Fulton Sheen. We just finished listening to him. No? One of the images he gives in one of his talks is uh, uh, a drop of water falls into an ugly sewer and then a ray of God's sun descends upon that, transforms that into a beautiful snowflake and places on the top of the highest mountain. Oh, talk about poetry. <laughs> I love that image. That's today. We're the drop that fell into the sewer and God, by the rays of his divine mercy, it transforms that ugly, dirty drop of water into a beautiful snowflake which drops on the top of Mount, Mount Himalaya. <laughs> yes. God allows the evil to bring greater good out of evil. Okay, so the, the passage that I chose for, for this morning related to sin and mercy is John chapter 4 which is the the woman at the well given the 75 percent of our retreatants are women here um, J Jesus was sometimes really tough on the men, but always gentle to women. Did you ever notice that? Be aware of that. But with Peter and I mean the Lord, but he's always very gentle with women. Even even the big sinners. And you're gonna see that in John chapter four. John chapter four and John chapter eight. You know John chapter eight? You saw the film of Mel Gibson, the woman caught in adultery, they're about to throw stones and see how gentle Jesus is with this woman. He's writing on the ground. And Jesus forgives this woman. It's 
So you women, pray for us men when the Lord's tough with us, okay? <laughs> Even his toughness is a manifestation of his love for us. <laughs> okay. So, in the spiritual exercises, uh, annotation number one in the Ignatian text, Spiritual exercises, it can be vocal prayer, it can be mental prayer, it can be meditation, it can be examination on the capital sins, it can be, and then he says, and other things. So the way you pray, there should be a lot of liberty. I'm throwing out at you a lot of different ideas, so when you talk with your spiritual director, don't feel that it always has to be one way. God may even, during this retreat, challenge you to change some of the ways in which you've been praying. We don't want to be stodgy and stultified, but rather we want to be open to God's, God's movement. So, let's take John chapter 4. It's a long, beautiful chapter. And Jesus is, Jesus is in, in, um, in Samaria. The Jews did not have a good relationship with, with Samaritans. But interesting, the gospel almost always presents the Samaritans in a positive light. Very, the good Samaritan, right? Even though the Jews had a rejection for them. It's like if your, your daughter married a Jehovah Witness. So it was a Jew that married a pagan. So it was, the Jews saw these people as Benedict Arnolds, as betrayers. So they had a, a rejection toward the Samaritans. And even on one occasion, when the apostles with Jesus, they're, they're going through Samaria and uh, they were not received. This, the sons of thunder, Bonerges, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? And our Lord says, no, that's not why I came. So let's try to utilize an Ignatian, con let's go into the contemplative mode, okay? the contemplative mode, trying to imagine this scene. Contemplation, my friends, in a certain sense is easier than meditation. Meditation, you know, discursive reasoning is, it takes mental labor. Whereas the content contemplation is you're entering into the scene. You become part of it. It's like you're going to a movies, huh? You go in the movies and you're you're watching the movie with the big screen. But there's a difference between going to movies and contemplation. In the movies, you're a passive spectator. spectator. Where in contemplation, you're an active participant. Movie, you go there, you're just sitting there, you're, you're popping popcorn in your mouth and Coca-Cola. You're a passive spectator. Whereas in the contemplation, you're an active participant. You want to become part of the scene. If you, this is a time when you people can start to do contemplations. In the exercise, I've taught you at least briefly contemplation. Now is the time in which you can really exercise this type of prayer. Utilizing your imagination to enter into this, the life of Christ. So let's, uh, let's try to picture what's going on. Jesus is with his disciples. It's about midday. And um, it's hot. They're tired. They're hungry. They're thirsty. So the apostles, they go off to the town to, to, to buy provisions. Whereas Jesus, he goes to the well. He goes to the well. 
women would go to the well. You know, when you want water, what do you do? You go to your refrigerator, you got your bottled water. They didn't have bottled water back then. They would have wells, cisterns, and they would go to the wells and they would have to, they'd have a big bucket that they'd actually have on their head, they'd fill it up and they'd go back to their, their home. They would not go at 12 noon because they're really hot. They go early in the morning. So why was this woman going to be going at 12 noon? Very interesting, huh? So Jesus is there and this woman goes there at noon because she's a woman that's not living a very good life. So Jesus is going to be going out of all protocol. Jews would not speak with Samaritans and much less would a rabbi be speaking with a woman. That's just, that was not the social milieu, the culture, that was not done. Jesus cutting through all protocol, he sees the woman there and what does he say? Woman, give me to drink. You could spend the whole day on those few words. Woman, give me to drink. I think Jesus right now in this retreat is saying, Marina, Mimi, Elvira, Kathy, Rita, Mary, Patrick, Barbara, Nancy, give me the drink. Give me the drink. Easily could spend an hour just on that. Any of us. That has so many different ramifications. So when Jesus is saying, give me, give me the drink, what is he asking you to give him the drink to slake his thirst? Spend time on that. See how rich the word of God is? So rich. Give me to drink. Then the conversation goes on. You who are a Jew, you ask me, a Samaritan, to drink? Fulton Sheen, in one of his commentaries on this, is a, is a biblical spiritual masterpiece. What he does in biblical theology is he reveals himself to the woman gradually. It's called the principle of graduality, of progress, or progressivity. Progr little by little, he's revealing himself to this woman, and that's what Christ is doing to you right now. You people came into this retreat with one vision of Christ. You're going to live, hopefully, with a total, totally different vision of Christ in eight days, if you're open. You thought you knew him. Yeah, más o menos, huh? Menos que más, huh? The Lord is going to be pulling the scales from our eyes, our blinders, so we can see him with greater clarity. Fulton Sheen points out that Christ reveals himself to this woman in about five different ways. Number one, he's a man. Number two, he's a Jew. Number three, he's a prophet. Number four, he's a Messiah. 
And finally, he is the son of the living God. It's a gradual revelation of Christ. It's almost like the Old Testament is gradually revealing who Christ will be once he comes in the flesh, in the incarnation. And even to a lot of your relatives and friends that are far away from God, maybe they can start to see Christ at least gradually. Now the curtains in the room are open and there's just some rays of light coming in. And your, your children or grandchildren that are in darkness, many of them, right? So Jesus is talking with this woman. It's a lively conversation. I'm giving you a couple ideas. And then, I think there's a little bit of humor in this. Jesus says, well, go get your husband. What does she say? I don't have a husband. She says, that's right. You've had sex and you're living with another one that's not your husband. I think there's a little bit of humor in that. No? To this woman, this woman has probably been used by men okay, as an object, as is often is the case. Finally, she's going to meet someone who really loves her not for her physical appearance, but for the inner depths of her soul. And that's you right now. Christ loves you infinitely. In the very depths of your soul. You have great dignity and great value and great destiny too. The two Ds, your dignity and your destiny. Then what happens? The apostles come back and they say, Lord, why didn't you eat? And he said, my food is to do what? To the will of my heavenly father. Okay, now look at this woman. See, you know, God allows evil to bring great good out of evil. This woman had lived a very promiscuous life, to put it mildly. No? Living with six, now she's with another one. No? And don't tell me seven is the number of perfection. Come on. No? <laughs> she's lived a pretty promiscuous life, huh? Okay. Jesus saw the inner dignity of this woman and he saw that this woman had great leadership qualities. This woman had leadership qualities. I'd like to make a parallel. Yesterday in the refectory we were listening to Fulton Sheen with his converts. Maybe you weren't there, but I think one of the, this is probably of the, my three favorite stories of his converts. Some of you who maybe been from New York have heard of the Hudson River and you heard of the Manhattan and the, the George Washington Br Bridge. <coughs> if you're a New Yorker, this woman her name was Kitty. Kitty, Spanish, gatita, okay? Kitty, Kitty. She was the most famous prostitute in New York. She was the head. And the story points out that her pimp, the one that's overlooking the prostitute, 
was angry at her because she was not bringing in enough business. The pimp wants money, huh? So what did he do? She was poisoned. So there she is in her tenement there on the outskirts of New York City. And Fulton Sheen hears about this and he goes into her room and it looked like a pig sty. Know what a pig sty means? A pig sty. He said he never saw a room more dirty and disordered, an indication of her interior life, obviously. And she's dying. So Foot and Sheen comes in and invites her to go to confession. And she says, Father, I'm the worst sinner in the world. He says, no, you're not. The worst sinner in the world is the one who says he doesn't have any sin. So he sits down, he hears her confession, and she was dying, she was poisoned. Goes to confession, her health is restored. She was a Catholic. She, got, she went back to the sacraments to receive the Eucharist. She renounces her profession as a prostitute, and Fulton Sheen, there in New York, day after day after day, he opens up his confessional door, and guess what? One of Kitty's prostitute friends is going to confession. This is the woman at the well. Because this woman at the well, she ran to Samaria. Listen, I have met a man who's told me everything I've ever done in my life. Come and see him. And they were converted because of the Samaritan woman. And what she, when Jesus comes, it went even more so. So God allows evil to bring greater good out of evil. So in your life, rewind the film of your life today. Rewind it. And see how God allowed you to slip and fall into the into the mud puddle, into the quicksand. But he grabbed you and he pulled you out. And like that image of Fulton Sheen, you, you were that drop of water that, that fell into the, into the gutter. But God's ray of divine light transformed you into that beautiful snowflake and deposited you on the top of the highest mountain. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou, and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sins now and at the hour of our death. Saint Joseph, pray for us, Father. Son.